Now we can look at polar molecules and dipole-dipole interactions. So when you have a polar molecule, uh, you have a, a permanent dipole moment. So you have one side is positive, one side is negative. So over here you can see the side is negative, this side is positive, and what happens is those little positive and negative signs, they line up with other ones. So the positive end of one molecule uh, is attracted to the negative end of another molecule, that sort of thing. So this is like the solid where it's a little bit more aligned, you have more interactions here, uh, and then the liquid, they're a little bit more chaotic, they're moving around a little bit more. So molecules can be, um, you can see a, a variety of, um, of polarity. So some molecules are more polar than others. So this over here, this is propane. Um, this is nonpolar. It just has carbons and hydrogens. Carbon and hydrogen bonds generally going to be nonpolar. Um, once you start adding some polar groups like a C double bond O or the C triple bond N, anything like that where you have um, different different molecules and again you know how to tell if something's polar or nonpolar, really that's what we need to know. You need to be able to distinguish between something that's polar and nonpolar and say if they're about the same um, size, they're about the same, have the same mass, then the polar molecule is going to have a higher boiling point because the dipole-dipole interactions are stronger than the London forces. So London forces have, are the weakest forces, and then you have dipole-dipole interactions, and then you have a really specific type of dipole-dipole interaction that's called a hydrogen bond. We'll get to that one next. So right now, we just need to know that if you increase the polarity of the molecule, if you go from, and really we're to compare nonpolar to, to polar, as long as they have about the same mass and they're the same size, the polar molecule should have a higher boiling point. And so that's kind of what we see here. And, and, and um, polarity, you know, the dipole moment is something that you can measure, something you can calculate. Um, we're gonna we're gonna use a um, Spartan in our in our lab for this, um, a computer like simulation program, and we're gonna be able to calculate the dipole moment. Uh, and then you can, you can kind of compare that to say this one's more polar than that one. So here, this guy is your nonpolar molecule. This one is a little bit more polar. Boiling point is 231 versus 355. So you can see the polar molecule has um, much stronger forces holding it together. So that's why it requires more energy to, um, to make it change, change its phase of matter. So the boiling point is higher because these molecules are um, more stuck together. They're, they're holding onto each other a little bit more tightly, so you have to break those bonds. So all those little red um, dotted lines, you're going to have to break those in order to uh, change the phase of matter. Think about it that way. So what's going to have a greater effect? Dipole-dipole interactions or dispersion forces? Well, if you have two molecules that are about the same size, it's going to come down to the polarity. It's going to come down to the dipole-dipole interactions are going to be stronger, so that should have a higher boiling point. Um, but if the molecule gets a lot bigger, if one's bigger than the other, then the dispersion forces start to take over. And so those are your London forces. So remember, everybody has London forces. Um, Nonpolar molecules, that's the only force it has. Uh, polar molecules have London, but also dipole dipole interactions. And so the dipole dipole forces are stronger um, in a, you know, obviously, in a, in a polar molecule, they're going to have dipole dipole interactions. Um, now this picture is looking at boiling point versus molecular weight, and each of those colors represents a different group, so a different family, uh, and then adding up hydro adding hydrogens on there. And you can see in general, so if you ignore these three, and these are special, and we'll talk about why, but everybody else, as you increase the molar mass, you're going to increase the boiling point. But these three molecules have ridiculously high boiling points for their size, right? So water, you've got HF, you've got NH3. What's special about these guys? They have a very specific type of dipole-dipole interaction, which is called a hydrogen bond. So it's an unusually strong dipole-dipole interaction. And this happens when you have a hydrogen that's directly attached to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. So really, you just create this super polar bond, and, um, and, and that makes the, the molecule have unusually high uh, boiling points, which is a really strong force that's holding them together. So in this picture, you can see, you know, you have a hydrogen directly attached to an oxygen, right? That's your intramolecular force, but this creates a super strong dipole moment. So this side is partially negative. This side is partially positive. Let's do those two little deltas. Um, no, I totally messed that up. The oxygen is more electronegative, that's going to be negative. This guy's going to be partially positive. Um, 
this is positive, this guy is negative. So the positive end of one is attracted to the negative end of the other. So that's the intermolecular force. The hydrogen bond is that dotted line there. It's the intermolecular force. It's the force that's holding this water molecule together with that water molecule. So HF, you can see the same thing, the negative end here. This is the positive side. That's going to be attracted to the positive side of another molecule, um, negative to positive. Uh, NH3, same situation, positive attracted to the negative. Um, you always need a hydrogen directly attached to an oxygen, a nitrogen, or a fluorine. Um, and they don't have to be the same molecule, right? So uh, NH3 can react with, can sorry, interact with this water molecule. You can form a hydrogen bond there. You can form a hydrogen bond there. Um, hydrogen bonds are um, really strong dipole-dipole interactions. And so you can find these. Um, hydrogen bonds are things that they hold, let's see, DNA together. So when you have DNA, you have this uh, double-stranded DNA, right? And you have those base pairs. Remember all those base pairs? You have something like this. The thing that's holding those base pairs together is hydrogen bonds. Right? So you have nitrogenous bases. So if they have nitrogen on them, um, they're going to interact with um, the you know, you have oxygens and hydrogens on the other side. So remember, they only pair in certain certain ways to accommodate for these hydrogen bonds. Um, what else? Hydrogen bonds hold together amino acid structures. So amino acids, are, um, sorry, protein structures, which are made of amino acids. Amino acids, so they have, um, they also form hydrogen bonds to, you know, their alpha helix. Uh, you have hydrogen bonds holding together these alpha helices. Uh, they also form their secondary structure. Another secondary is their beta pleated sheets. There's also hydrogen bonds in there. Um, so you find hydrogen bonds as uh, stabilizing forces in a lot of different places in nature, so DNA, proteins, that sort of thing. Hydrogen bond also gives um, water its unique structure that uh, in a solid, right? So when you freeze water, what happens to it? It expands. So it expands in the solid phase um, to accommodate for all these hydrogen bonds. And so it actually spreads out a little bit more. And so ice floats on the surface of liquid water, right? The solid of water floats on the liquid of water uh, because of these hydrogen bonds, which is crazy, uh, but very useful for us. So ice floats because um, hydrogen bonds make the structure more open so it's less dense. All right, so let's try to see if we can identify some of the um, you know, hydrogen bond, which, which of the following molecules are going to, can hydrogen bond with them with themselves. So I'll try to draw these Lewis structures and then you can decide, does it form a hydrogen bond? So we have methane. Methane looks like this. You can try to draw these Lewis structures too as a review, right? So that's methane, hydrazine. Hydrazine looks like that. Oh, we need some... Lewis structures, we need our uh, dots, uh, methyl fluoride. So all we're doing is trying to figure out which of these will actually form hydrogen bonds and why hydrogen sulfide and methylene chloride So just draw all these Lewis structures and phosphine and then let's figure out who actually forms hydrogen bonds and why. And acetone. Okay, so who's going to form hydrogen bonds here? So in order to form a hydrogen bond, you need a hydrogen directly attached to a nitrogen, an oxygen, or fluorine. So this guy does not have that. This one does, right? Hydrogen is directly attached to a nitrogen. Great, so this guy can form hydrogen bonds. And how is that gonna happen? Well, this hydrogen is going to interact with a nitrogen over here, something like that. All right, so you can have a hydrogen bond that way. Um, this guy has a fluorine, but it doesn't have a hydrogen attached to that fluorine, so that's not gonna help. I should do these in red, right? So no. No, this guy is yes. That's what it looks like. Uh, does this guy have hydrogen directly attached to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine? Nope. This guy does not. This guy does not. Ah, yes. Um, hydrogen peroxide. So this will 
lots of hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen, something like that. So the oxygen on this guy will be attracted to the hydrogen over there. And then acetone um, uh, can't form hydrogen bonds with itself, but it could with water, right? So if I had, and that, but that's not the question, but if that was the question, does this form hydrogen bonds with water? It could, it could form a hydrogen bond right there because um, this is polar, but it, it won't form a hydrogen bond to itself.